How you doing? Oh, are you kidding me right now? No, 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 no. You got to amp it up. You know where the coffee is, right? How are you? Oh, good. Thank you. Um, so I, I am Pamela Morgan, and, and I am an attorney, uh, but I've been working full-time in the Bitcoin and open blockchain space since early uh, 2014. And that has caused my career path to change quite a bit. Um, in the early days, I started by helping um, entrepreneurs in this space kind of organize their companies. And then I realized that uh, that that people were stealing Bitcoin from these companies. And so I started looking at multi-signature and how we can use internal governance and policies to make sure that one employee doesn't run away with the money or that you know you raise money in Bitcoin and a hack doesn't happen and all of your money is gone. And then that led to asking about individual finances and saying, okay, hey, you have a Bitcoin company. You have assets in Bitcoin. What's going to happen to them if something happens to you? What happens to your family? Are they going to be able to inherit these assets? And everyone said no. <laughs> and the reason they said no is because with Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency assets, we're taught to keep our private keys private. And so there's this problem. We need to keep these secrets secret so that people don't steal from us. And then at the same token, we need to make something available so that our, so that our heirs will be able to inherit these assets. And so for the past year and a half, I've been focused on that, and I'm currently doing some research now about it, and I'll tell you later. Um, but today, I want to talk to you about what happens to your Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency assets um, when you die. One important thing you'll notice the CC by SA, um, almost all of the work that I do and almost all of the work that we do at Third Key Solutions is Creative Commons licensed. This presentation means uh, is licensed by CC by SA uh, 4.0 International. What that means is you can take it, you can use it, you don't have to ask my permission, you can cut it up, you can make derivatives, you can do whatever you want with it, um, give attribution and share with the rest of the community. That's all I ask. So let's get started. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's, it's rare for lawyers to share their work, um, but we're hoping that, uh, that more lawyers will, will start to do this in the future. And I think uh, with the open source movement and, and this community, we can, we can make that happen. So, all right, let's start with a quiz. You didn't know there was a quiz, did you? All right, so don't worry, you can't fail. Um, if you die without a will, and, and here I understand that it's called a testament. So if you die without a will or a testament, who decides how your assets are going to be divvied up? So most people are answer number A. <laughs> I have no idea. I've never considered it. And then those that have considered it, if you're not a lawyer, most people think B. They think my family gets to decide. But the actual answer is C, the state. Every single local jurisdiction has a law that says if somebody dies without a will, if somebody dies without officially telling us what's going to happen to their assets, we have a plan for that. Don't you worry. The state's going to take good care of you. Um, <laughs> so what does that plan look like? Well, the state recognizes relationships that are, um, that are approved by the state. That means in English, they recognize blood relationships and they recognize relationships by marriage. So if you officially marry, you get a marriage license and you register with the state, that is a relationship that is recognized typically by the state. Other relationships, such as uh, long-term live-in domestic partners, boyfriends, girlfriends, best friends, children that are yours not through, not through blood, but maybe by marriage, often in other jurisdictions. None of these people will take if you leave it to the state. If you leave it to the state, the state will allocate your resources, your assets, to none of these people. So this is really important. And now you can see why I'm, I'm so focused on this, because I don't want that to happen. And my guess is that you don't want that to happen either. So what can we do to get it out of the state and into your control? Well, we can plan. And so the next question is, today, right now, as you sit here, inheritance of your cryptocurrency depends on what? How many of you have a friend who knows your password? <laughs> okay, maybe six or eight. And uh, how about your family remembering what you've told them about Bitcoin and a sticky note? 
<laughs> okay, probably 20. Yes. Um, and how about you never dying? Immortality. Who's going with that? Yes, the majority of people going with immortality. You will be pleased to know that that is common throughout the world. It's not just here. Uh, immortality is the go-to answer. However, the best answer would be D, a detailed, documented, and, and tested plan. Um, this is, is my hope for after this presentation, you'll fall into the D category, um, but, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, I want you to think about that, and hopefully I'm going to make it easy enough that you'll actually fall into the D category. The most important thing you need to know is that planning puts you in control. If you don't plan, you have no control. The state controls and everyone else controls. So why do that? We're in cryptocurrency. You're already controlling your keys. That tells me that you're interested in controlling your assets. So let's talk about planning. When I travel the world, I talk to people about estate planning, and there are some things that keep coming up over and over again. Now, I'm not going to call them excuses. I'm going to call them mistaken beliefs. So the first mistaken belief and the most common is, I don't want to do estate planning because I have to hire a lawyer. That is untrue. You do not have to hire a lawyer, okay? Estate planning for cryptocurrencies is divided into two separate and distinct things. One involves the tech side, and that is key access. So how can people access your keys? Most lawyers don't even know what a key pair is let alone they cannot help you try and, and, and create a security plan that will allow you to keep your private keys private but also have them pass. That's not something that a lawyer would do, but that's something that you can do. I just wanted to let that sit there for a minute. You with me now? I talk kind of fast sometimes. So you don't actually need to hire a lawyer to do the tech side of your plan. Now, the tech side won't stand alone, right? The law is always there in the background. And so it is a good idea to hire a lawyer to help you with the legal side. But you wouldn't go to a lawyer first and say, hey, I have some cryptocurrency that I need to secure and make sure it passes to my heirs because they're going to say, you have a what? You have a Bitcoin? Uh, what do you do for a living? Um, so, you know, <laughs> the, the idea is you can take care of the, te uh, of the tech or key access side first, and then you can go to a lawyer if you decide that you want to include a, a legal implementation plan. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. But you don't use I don't want to hire a lawyer as an excuse not to plan. Next, uh, I have to trust a third party. I don't want to trust a third party. And if I do estate planning, I'm going to have to. This, too, is false. While usually the easiest solutions, the most convenient solutions, involve you trusting a third party, you do not have to do that as part of an estate plan. In fact, there are lots of creative things you can do. Uh, how many of you use Trezors or a hardware wallet? Great, many of you. We are in Prague. Um, so, and how many of you use passphrases with those Trezors? Okay, uh, I would say almost all. Um, past phrases, oh, and for, for you who are watching, hello, uh, that was probably about 45 to 50% of the audience. Um, so for those of you that use past phrases, you know that you never store your past phrase and your seed together, right? Because then someone has access. If you separate those two out, that's a way to separate control without having to ultimately trust a third party. And there are lots of creative ways to do this. You can use multi-sig. You can do all sorts of different things. And, and each plan is kind of unique um, depending on you and your family and your situation. But you don't have to trust a third party. Next, I hear, if I write this stuff down, somebody's going to get a hold of my written plan and then they're going to follow it step by step and they're going to and they're going to get all of my assets right this is so people fear that planning is going to make them less secure this is also false and the reason is because you're not going to write a plan that has all of your access points in one document and then keep it on an online machine right you would not do that. So what you would do is you would handwrite your plan and you would separate out your access controls. You wouldn't put your seed words in the plan itself. You would have those separate. Okay, so planning does not make you less secure. In fact, you're much more likely to lose your Bitcoin or other crypto assets because you lost your password or forgot it, because your device uh, became broken or disabled, 
because you lost your computer or your hard drive crashed. These are the real reasons why most people lose access to their cryptocurrencies, not because they've planned so well for their estate. Um, and finally, the last mistaken belief that I hear all the time is, the amount of crypto I have is too low. It's not worth it for me to hire a lawyer and trust a third party, and I don't want to lose what little I have, so I don't want to plan. All I'm going to say is, how many of you were here in March of this year? <laughs> how many of you are in Bitcoin in March of this year? Uh -huh. And how much has the price gone up since March? Oh, all I hear is smiles and laughter. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so the price has gone up pretty significantly. Same for Ether, same for pretty much everything, right? Some say we're in a bubble. I say, I don't care. Uh, it <laughs> doesn't matter, right? Um, it doesn't matter because no matter what the value is, you want to protect it. Why not? It's easy. You don't have to spend money to do it. You can do this. So the value is too low. Seems like kind of a... a kind of a sorry excuse to me. The real reason why we don't do estate planning, and when I say we, I mean even people like myself, even people who work in estate planning, often put it off, often don't do it, and the real reason is denial and fear. We don't want to face our own mortality. We don't want to think about dying. We don't want to think about it, and we somehow believe if we don't think about it, and we don't talk about it, it won't happen, right? We don't, we don't have to face it as if it's, you know, as if it's Voldemort or something. So, you know, the idea is um, we need to get past this denial and fear. And so how do we do that? Well, my dad was raised as a Christian scientist. And for those of you who don't know what that is, um, the nicest way I can say it is basically uh, people... Uh, use their mind to overcome challenges. And he taught me very early that the human experience is often based upon perception and that we can change our attitudes about things simply by choosing to look at things a different way. Take a look at this picture. How many of you see a duck? Raise your hand. How many of you see a bunny? Raise your hand. How many of you now see both a duck and a bunny? <laughs> okay, great. Hopefully you see both. This is the bill of the duck, and it's also the ears of the bunny rabbit. The point of this is to say that we can see things, the same thing, in two different ways. And so I'm going to give you three different ways to look at estate planning that will hopefully help you overcome this fear and denial. Are you ready? Okay. First, for those of you in the audience who are helpers and you know who you are, the ones who feel really great when you give a gift, it makes you feel good to help other people. Think of estate planning as this magical gift that you're going to give to your friends, to your family, to, to a worthy cause. Think of it like, you, what if you received a gift of all the cryptocurrency you have right now? What if someone just walked up to you and gave you the equivalent? You'd be pretty happy, right? So you can look at estate planning like this is your opportunity to give a wonderful gift to your friends, to your family, to whomever you like. If that doesn't work for you and you're a little more practical, you can think of this as an opportunity to do a security makeover. Because when you do estate planning, you need to actually look at, at everything that you have. And that includes that ICO that you bought into that you haven't told anyone about? Yeah, that one. Um, so you need to actually do an inventory on your assets, and this will help you look at, okay, hey, where are my backups? Did I actually back up that wallet? How much is in there now? Where are my cold storage wallets? This will help you do that. So for those of you who are looking for a good excuse, think of it as a security makeover plus a gift. But my personal favorite way to look at it is that you're on a secret time machine mission, okay? So imagine, imagine in the future, someone is gonna find this beautiful cash that you left for them and they're gonna follow the path and they're gonna unlock untold riches, right? So you can gamify this thing. Whatever it takes for you to get over that denial and fear, use this. 
think of it as something fun because it doesn't have to suck. It can be really great and it can be a really powering, empowering experience if you decide to look at it like that. So where do you start? You're ready to start, what do you do? Um, I've written a couple of articles about this and the first is a letter to loved ones template. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about exactly what you need to do in just a second. Um, but if you haven't taken a look at the, at the letter to loved ones template, I have it up and I'll show you after the, the presentation is finished. It is literally a template of a letter. It says, dear loved one, if you're reading this letter, I wanted you to know that I have cryptocurrency. This is something that I own and control. You need to be very careful. Watch anyone who wants to help you recover it. All of those sorts of things that you might need to let your loved ones know. This is again, available to you freely. Take it, use it, cut out the stuff that doesn't make sense for you. It has a section that says, for example, I have an account with X exchange and this is how you're going to access it if you need to. I have a Trezor device. I have a samurai wallet on my phone. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that will allow your heirs to actually inherit your assets. So if you like the letter format, feel free to start there. If you like something that's a little bit more step-by-step, -step, then try the article, uh, Seven Steps to Estate Planning for Bitcoin. And that is in much greater detail of what you need to do, not in a letter format, but in a kind of directive format. So the very first thing that you can do today on the break after this session is take a piece of paper and write down an inventory of your, of your cryptocurrencies, of your holding. And when I say inventory, I do not mean write down how many Bitcoin you have. You don't need to do that. It's actually a really bad idea to do that because if your heirs find that later and you've sold a bunch of Bitcoin, then they'll think that someone stole it. Okay, so you don't wanna do that and you don't need to do that. All you need to do is write down, okay, I have Bitcoin and I access it on my phone through my Samurai wallet. I have Ether and I access it through my Trezor device using my Ether wallet, okay? This is super important if you're using Trezors or other devices where you have a single seed that controls a number of different cryptocurrencies because it's very rare that your seed, that your 24 words, will have anything related to what currencies you have. And so if you're using different software, your family will have no idea what you actually have and will not be able to access it unless they have a list of the assets that you have. Make sense? Okay, next. So step one, inventory. Step two, security self audit. You guys are not as excited about this as I am. Security self audit, yeah. Um, so it can actually be really fun and again, super empowering for you to go through where are you keeping your backups? You know, did you give, did you give one to your mom to put behind that painting in the living room? Is it still there or did it fall and get thrown away? So what you wanna do is, is kind of do a whole inventory and find out where your backups are. Do you need to make new backups? Have you downloaded new wallets? So do a full security audit. Um, in, I didn't tell you this yet, but I wrote an article that is, uh, that's a supplement to this talk, uh, and I posted it on Medium like an hour ago. <laughs> so um, for those of you who want links to the information I'm about to give you, it's all there on Medium and you can link to these. Um, I've written an article about using password managers. Um, for those of you who don't know how to use a password manager, it's very simple and it's written for people who are using basically the same passwords everywhere to get them onboarded to a password manager. I've also written an article about uh, 2FA and I do wanna take just this one quick second to go off topic and say, if you have not removed SMS from recovery on your accounts, you need to do that now. Um, a lot of people are losing Bitcoin and they're losing access to many other important accounts because people are easily porting numbers uh, from the cell phone carriers to, <laughs> to their own numbers and then basically people are getting pawned. So um, make sure that you remove your, your recovery, uh, make sure you remove SMS from recovery and your phone from recovery. Um, how many of you think you own your phone number? Don't put your hands up, keep them down. Okay, good. 
Nobody owns their phone number. The carriers own your phone number. And that's why this is happening. Because you would never give access to someone else, but it's not your number. Um, quickly, I want to talk about access controls just because um, this is something that I don't think a lot of people know about or do. Uh, this is an evidence bag or a money bag. And uh, they're available on Amazon. They're opaque. They have a number on them. And once they're sealed, they're tamper evident. You can use these to store, for example, a laminated seed and then keep a log of what the number is here separately and what it corresponds to. So for example, you could put your treasure seed in one of these and store it at your cousin's house in their safe. And when you do an audit, you would know if someone looked at that seed or had access to it. It's cheap, really, really cheap. I think you can buy a hundred for like something like 20 euro, um, you know, and, and it'll be delivered to your home. So uh, that's one thing you can do to have access control so that you'll know if your seed's been compromised. So after we do our inventory and we do our security audit, now it's time for your time machine message. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what you're gonna do is I want you, when you're writing this message, to kind of role play a little bit. Think about, like take everything you know about everything you have and put it to the side and pretend as if you are your heirs and walk through the plan step by step. Oh, the, the wallet, the keys are on your phone. Do you have a passcode on your phone? How are they going to get it? Yeah. So step by step, pretend that, that, that you're them and walk through the plan step by step. By the way, this does not mean that you should walk through these plans with your heirs. Okay. That is completely dependent upon you, and that's dependent upon your family situation and who your heirs are and all of those sorts of things. Um, so you don't have to, but you can pretend like you're them and kind of run through it yourself. Most importantly, <laughs> um, you know, test your message. So this is what I was trying to get at when I said role play. Um, if you, you have knowledge, we, we all have underlying assumptions that we don't recognize, right? So you assume that Bitcoin works a certain way because you're used to it. Other people do not. So for example, um, when I deal with lawyers, I, I often do lawyer trainings and lawyers always wanna hold keys. <laughs> I don't know why, because they're used to being trusted third parties, right? And so I have to explain to them that no, the assumptions that you're making about how Bitcoin works and how cryptocurrencies work do not translate. So when you're running through your time machine message, you know, try to put all of the, try to identify your underlying assumptions and put all of those to the side. Pretend like you're a total newbie. So now that you're done with keys, yeah, now, now you're done. You've got key access under control. You've got your inventory, you've got your security, you've got your time machine manual. Now we'll talk about law. So once you have all of those things done, then you need to consider law. And um, there are, as I said, default laws in every single jurisdiction. And those, those laws, sorry, I'm just doing a quick time check. Um, those laws will dictate who gets what. Um, so it's good for you to be familiar with them. Does that mean that you need to hire a lawyer? No, you can do research on your own. And then once you've got the research done, then look for a lawyer who is knowledgeable in cryptocurrency. And I understand that you guys have some lawyers uh, right here in Prague who are focused on, uh, on blockchain. So um, you're very fortunate in that area. Uh, so there are some people who can help you do that. They can help you make sure that your, your cryptocurrency is going to go to who you want it to go through, through the regular legal uh, channels. How many of you know what a legal trust is? Okay, so maybe four. Very good. Um, I understand that it's quite new here in, in, in Prague, especially, um, that it was introduced in like 2014. So many people don't know what a, a legal trust is. Um, I'm going to simplify it here, but basically all of you know what a company or a corporation is, right? So some companies and corporations are called holding companies. And those holding companies, their whole purpose is to hold assets for the benefit of the stockholders. Does that make sense? Are you there? 
Okay, good. Um, so, so the whole purpose of it is to hold for the benefit of the stockholders. With a legal trust, it's effectively the same thing. You create a separate legal entity that holds your personal assets for the benefit of people you designate as beneficiaries. And there are all sorts of different kinds of legal trusts, and they're untested so far here, but they're very well tested in the U.S. Uh, and the U.K. and elsewhere around the world. So this is an option. The beauty of this is because it's a separate entity, if you die, nothing's triggered. What I mean by that is the estate planning laws don't apply because the entity didn't die. Just because a person died, that has nothing to do with the entity itself. Now, that said, Trusts have different tax issues, different compliance issues, reporting issues, all those sorts of things. So that may or may not be right for you. It really depends on who you want to leave things to and how you want to do it and what your family situation is. Um, but if this is something that interests you, uh, you should, you'll definitely need to talk to a lawyer for that. So some of you have been sitting there and listening to this whole thing and you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But what about a dead man switch? Because this is what I hear nonstop. There are at least four projects that I'm aware of that I could name now that are working on software solutions with dead man switches. Um, I am not a fan right now. That doesn't mean ever. It just means right now for a number of reasons. First, the tech is immature. Um, we can't even keep multi-sig wallets safe in Ethereum. <laughs> Right? I think the, the loss now is, is well over the loss of the DAO, so I think it's about 200 million. Um, and that's for the most well-tested multi-sig contract in Ethereum. Um, so I don't think that a dead man switch is, is going to be anything that I'm going to put my money into or any of my clients' money into anytime soon. That said, it doesn't mean forever. Um, also, you know, you have issues of natural disasters. So like right now, Puerto Rico is without, uh, is without power. Um, often we assume, because we live in such a connected world, that we'll always have internet. How many of you are shocked when you go somewhere and your internet doesn't work? And are like, yeah, exactly. Everyone's like, what, what, what kind of world is this? Um, so we assume that we're always going to be able to be connected. But the reality is there are lots of things that can happen. Natural disasters is just one example of reasons why you wouldn't be able to connect and press that button and say, yes, I'm still alive. One of the reasons is because I might have an incentive to prevent you from pressing that button, particularly if I know that I'm a beneficiary, right? So it can incentivize bad action. Um, there are a ton of legal issues that come along with this. If you, ought, and I'm not gonna go into all of them, I just wanna say, if you automatically transfer your crypto to A, B, and C, but by law, only A and B are supposed to get your crypto. Do you know what happens? A and B sue C. <laughs> they sue C. Now you're like, they can't get the crypto. Right. Um, what else does C have? Does C have a house? Does C have a car? Does C have a retirement account? Does C have anything that's not crypto related? If the answer is yes, then the local court can go after those assets. So you could be inadvertently creating a big legal mess for your heirs when you actually don't have to. So this is, these are the reasons why I'm not in love with the dead man switch yet. There are a lot of people that are trying to solve all of these issues. And one of the things I love about this industry is that we innovate faster than anyone else. Um, I just want to close with the idea that, you know, humans die and crypto assets don't. And, uh, you know, these things could take your, your heirs to the moon. So why not let them? Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Pamela, for the amazing presentation. Thank you. Now, we have like 15 minutes for question and answers. Yes. Um, I'd like to point out that the question and also the answers are being recorded so especially when speaking about legal topic there are some questions you don't have to be you don't want to be recorded so um, if there are some questions just please like, raise on your hand and I will. if you want to ask sensitive questions we can I'll, i'm going to be staying after so 
Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, very interesting talk, but I still uh, don't quite get the, uh, the following idea. So if I have a bank account, if I have a house, if I have a car, they are registered with the state and the state knows that I own these assets and I have a document that proves it. But if I create a Bitcoin wallet and tell nobody about that, why involve state in this at all? I mean, I can uh, either share my key or write some kind of smart contract or whatever without ever telling any legal, like, official official uh, persons. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? Why involve the state? Great question. Um, I should have covered that in the presentation. Um, so here, here's the thing. Um, do you need to register you know, your Bitcoin account with anyone now? No. But remember that um, this, is, this is people. And when we get people involved, squirrely things happen. So for example, the state doesn't know about your Bitcoin now, right? You leave it to your son. And what does your son do with it? Does your son hold it and just hodl? Is your son a hodler? No, your son is like, yeah, sports car. Um, so your son goes out and starts buying a bunch of stuff, right? And they start posting it on Facebook. Yeah, that's right. They start posting it on, on, on Snapchat, Instagram, whatever you like, you know, use your social media of choice. And then what happens? The state gets wind of it and they come knocking on the door. Hello, son, where'd you get the assets? And now you're looking at a tax felony. Now you're looking at putting your children in the position of going to prison because they did not declare inheritance of assets. Am I saying that you have to do this? No. Am I saying that you know full declaration is right for everyone? No. What I am saying is think about the consequences of what you're doing and what kind of position you're going to put your heirs in. If they are good with that, who am I to say? <laughs> who, who am I to say what you can and can't do? Um, but understand that there are very significant legal risks that go along with having people inherit cryptocurrencies and not declaring them. Sorry, I wish there was another answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think I use a new wallet on my phone like every six months. And yes. so do you have any idea about how to keep these things up to date? Because, you know, I didn't even have a Litecoin wallet uh, half a year ago. Now I have two because I need to pay for coffee without paying transaction fees. And there are <laughs> these new blockchains every three months that I start using. And uh, I think what would be really interesting is some project that would kind of uh, consolidate all the secret information in one place so I don't have to think about it when I switch from, you know, bread wallet to something else. So that's a great question. Um, that's actually included in the, in the seven steps for uh, estate planning with Bitcoin. Um, but thank you for asking it now. So this solution is super low tech. Are you ready? Put a calendar reminder every three months, look at what your backups are. It's very simple. Set aside one hour to do a quick audit for yourself. And every, you know, every uh, September 1st, you know, every quarter, every January 1st and, you know, April 1st, et cetera, set a calendar reminder and make this part of your everyday routine until we get to the point where we can actually trust assets and, and sensitive information online which I'm not sure that we're gonna get there anytime soon. Um, you know, I wouldn't put all of this information online, but you can simply set a calendar reminder and then you actually have to do it, which is the hard part. Uh, but remind yourself to go and check those things. Okay, well, are there any other questions? Thank you. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Um, some people leave um, assets on exchanges, say uh, Coinbase, and something happens to you. Uh, is the right answer to leave instructions for someone to log in to Coinbase with your password and second factor authentication? Or um, somehow you should leave instructions for Coinbase to move your assets to someone else? Great question. Um, so I'm actually working on a project right now where I am talking to, attempting to talk to all of the exchanges and all of the hosted wallet providers and find out what their policies are for when an account holder dies and whether or not they allow trusts to own accounts. 
Um, I will tell you that legally, you will have difficulty if you try to leave your login information to someone after you pass and they access that account because they don't actually have the legal right to do that. And so if they do access the account without telling Coinbase, there could be problems down the road. Um, many of the account, many of the um, exchanges are just now dealing with these issues. Uh, I've had, the exchanges that I've talked to have had uh, as many as 50 different account holders die. Um, so this is a real problem that they're facing more and more often. Um, for me, the other interesting question is, okay, they've had all of these people contact them. How many people haven't? How many people didn't tell their family that they have an account on Coinbase or an account on Zappo? And so that money's just sitting there forever and there's no way for the family to access it because they don't even know. Um, so this is a disturbing uh, issue for me and this is one of the reasons why I care so much about estate planning because if we're gonna hold our own cryptocurrencies and we're getting, third, we're getting rid of third parties, then we have to do just a couple of extra things to make sure that our assets are, are secure. We have to replace them with, with our own processes and we can easily do that. Thank you for the question. Hello, I have a bit of a different question. And is there any legal precedence about Bitcoins involved in a divorce case where one partner tried to hide the Bitcoins from the other partner? Um, so, good question. First of all, uh, I should say that it is, it is impossible for any lawyer to know about every single jurisdiction. Uh, it's almost impossible for any lawyer, well, it is impossible for any lawyer to know offhand everything about a single jurisdiction because the law is really nuanced. Um, but there are laws that already exist about hiding assets. And so Bitcoin is not any different as far as the law is concerned. Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency is simply another asset, right? So if you try to hide it or you try to obfuscate its, its existence and the court finds out, you will be penalized. Um, also, it's kind of a shit thing to do. Sorry, <laughs> just my personal opinion. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that that's kind of a nasty thing to do. Um, I think, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Any other questions? Do you know of some countries with very low or no inheritance tax that you can include in the message for your years? <laughs> To move too many. <laughs> so, so I, I love where you're going with this. Are, are, are you a law student by any chance? Okay, well maybe you should be. Uh, so she's trying to, to say, you know, where, where are, the, are the tax havens, where are the friendly jurisdictions that we can have our estates um, adjudicated in? Uh, the problem is that uh, the adjudication will depend completely on where you claim residence at the time of your passing. So wherever your home address is, and uh, for those of us who are location independent, that's a little challenging, um, but generally it's gonna be wherever you say that your home address is or wherever um, property is located. So if you have real property located in uh, another country, for example, there may be, um, those laws may also apply. Um, that this is something that you can do with trusts, by the way, if you want to get creative, uh, there are friendly jurisdictions for trusts where you can create, uh, in the US, they're called foreign trusts. Um, and a lot of very, very wealthy people do this. Um, I, I don't know if you saw my presentation last year, which was about DAM. Yeah, you have to say it like that. It's, it's DAM, which is the uh, Decentralized Arbitration and Mediation Network. But that's all about uh, using arbitration which multinational huge companies have been using for years to get out of the regular court system that we can use. The whole trust thing is the same thing. How can we use existing systems that have traditionally benefited only the very, very wealthy? And how can we take those systems and co-opt them and make them usable for us <laughs> and what we want to do? So that, that I'm very, very interested in that. So if, if you want to do jurisdiction shopping, you could consider trusts. Uh, I have a question. Um, you you talked about uh, 
the legal ramifications if you just gave someone your access to your cryptocurrency without uh, any legal oversight. And I'm just wondering about, um, let's say you didn't uh, bother to do any of this legal stuff ahead of time, but you did provide a way to give cryptocurrency to someone that you trust or that you wanted to give it to. Uh, is there a way for them to... Um, go to the government and say, hey, I'm inheriting this uh, without any prior legal documentation about it and and legitimately claim that money, although it's probably taxed? Or is there, a, uh, is there a bigger penalty for doing that if you don't do it ahead of time? Great question. So, uh, so every jurisdiction is unique. So I can't speak to every single jurisdiction. But generally how, how it works is when someone passes away, the law kind of creates a temporary holding company, if you want to think about it like that. And they call that the estate of this person. And so all of their assets are then controlled by the estate. And then there's a person, who typically, maybe we're very excited about that. Uh, so, so typically, there's uh, someone called an executor. And they execute the will or or sometimes if there's no will, uh, the plan of the court. So they will take in all of the assets and kind of make it a big pool. And then they'll look at either what does the law say or what does the will say, and they'll divvy up those assets accordingly. So if you were to transfer cryptocurrency to a person who is not the executor outside of, um, outside of the estate, that person has an obligation to report that to the estate and make that available for distribution. Um, you know, whether or not people will know if you don't and all of those other things, you know, are, are, are subjects that we can talk about at another time. Uh, but yeah, they would typically have an obligation to report that they received a, a transfer and then make that available to, to the estate. To be honest with you, almost no one is doing this Right. I mean, th these are ideas that we have in the future, like we're going to use time lock transactions and we're going to give it to you, this person five years from now. How many of you are still using the same keys from five years ago? <laughs> exactly. So most of you are not. So we don't want to set up, you know, keys for our uh, heirs, however long from now and, and try and automatically fund those keys because, hey, you know, the signatures might change, the, the cryptography might change, all of these things might change. So we want to have some flexibility and be able to adapt. Um, so I'm not really seeing anyone doing automatic transfers, but I do see that in the future. Many of these startups are trying to, to add that as, a, as an option um, for the software that they're providing for estate planning. Um, earlier on, you said that you have talked to uh, many different kinds of uh, exchanges. And in my experience, they are quite different, different in their policies about the know your customer policy. So, for example, at Bitstamp, I encountered that I had to provide some legal documents about my resi residence and so on. Mm -hmm. And this was, I think, much more than on some other exchanges. So, for example, if I would die and my, my wife would have the legal documents ready, which clearly states that I'm dead, could they, for example, talk to Bitstamp to open the account for her? Absolutely. That's exactly what happens. So usually when, when someone passes, the, the heir or whomever you know, knows that this happened and wants access will contact the exchange. And so what I'm specifically interested in is what are those policies? What happens internally at the exchange when someone is, is contacted? And what documents do they need? And how long does the process take? And are there um, industry standards? Uh, no is the answer right now. Um, but I, I'm going to be writing up a, a report on my research and hopefully helping the industry to develop some, some best practices. Um, for those exchanges that do not do KYC or do not have information available, um, this is why it is so very, very important for you to do an inventory and for you to make sure that your heirs will be able to access these accounts. Um, also, just on a, on a side note, remember, not your keys, not your money. Do not leave money on exchanges. 
um, it's, it's, it's not secure, right? Uh, unless you're controlling the keys on the exchange, uh, and, and that's pretty rare these days. So don't leave money on an exchange if you want to keep it. Uh, that's my that's my PSA for you. Any other questions? Thank you so much for attending this talk. I, I'm so, so glad that you were here, and I hope that you found it helpful.